Good to be with everyone on the webinar. Got another great group with us and a tremendous panel uh, covering a, a variety of topics that I'll mention in just a minute. As Kathy mentioned, uh, again, all comments uh, are welcome. All feedback is welcome. No, that with the exception of any comments about how shiny my head might be uh, in the webinar, but all other comments uh, are welcome and appreciated here. We do look at them. Uh, for those of you who take the time to pass along uh, positive comments, we really appreciate that. Uh, it means a lot. We started this programming uh, almost two years ago to the day uh, as a resource for our clients, uh, as well as for the communities where we all practice. Uh, and it, it's uh, definitely good to hear that this has been uh, a value to you, that the programming has been appreciated. So thank you for sending along those positive messages too. They're appreciated. All right, so we're gonna cover a wide variety of topics on today's webinar. So first we're gonna to talk to John Godso, um, one of my friends and partners in our Buffalo office who practices in the area of employee benefits. Uh, we're gonna also have a discussion with Travis Tallarico who's gonna talk about an important piece of pending federal legislation uh, that deals with the issue of sexual harassment and assault and will have a significant impact for employers. And finally, one of my other friends and colleagues, Jessica Mahler in our downstate offices is going to talk to you about a topic that I know is still top of mind for many that being paid COVID leave under New York law. All right, so with that, let me introduce John Godso. Again, John is uh, not new to the program. I'm sure you've heard him before presenting on a variety of topics. Um, in, in, uh, before I do that, why don't I just talk a little bit about some of the COVID trends too and just tell you what's going on very, very briefly. So again, same uh, progress that we're seeing. Uh, the next slide will talk about the nationwide data. Uh, and again, we're seeing that, that uh, continued precipitous drop. Uh, again, good news, getting us down to where we were before the Omicron variant uh, really took hold. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see some data tied to New York. Uh, and just a couple things to mention there. Uh, the top orange slide deals with the number of cases, the seven-day average, and the bottom, uh, deals with the, the deaths that we're seeing as a result of COVID. Again, the deaths being a lagging indicator. Uh, just for your reference here, I included a couple arrows so that you can see. Again, on the top side right now, our seven-day average is about 4,500 uh, cases. If you go back to the peak uh, of a recent spike, uh, back in early January, we were seeing uh, 85 thousand cases as a seven day average. So again, a very significant drop off and continued progress there. Uh, as always, I'd like to keep an eye on the hospitalizations too. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see continued good news on that front. Uh, we do have uh, ample, um, I think, uh, bandwidth remaining in terms of uh, capacity at the hospitals, both with respect to ICU beds and regular inpatient beds. And once again, we see the continued trend of, you know, only a, a relatively small portion of existing hospital beds uh, being used for uh, treatment of COVID or with COVID patients. So again, uh, I think continued progress and positive news on all of those fronts. Uh, hopefully more to continue uh, ahead. Uh, and just a quick note on, on masking here. Uh, we covered this last week and we were uh, waiting for news from the state on developments there. Of course, we did get that. Uh, I know we published an article on our blog and pushed that out through the New York Labor and Employment Law Report. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, I, I encourage you to do so. You can link to that blog right from our website at bskbonshenikking.com. Uh, but what we saw were three things. One, that the, the generally applicable indoor masking uh, rule was, was going to be lifted. Uh, again, this was welcome news, I'm sure, in a, in a number of areas, including with respect to many of our clients and employers across the state, um, whose employees uh, and other uh, stakeholders were eager uh, to make that progress. Uh, at the same time, the governor indicated that masks still would be required in schools. Uh, and uh, for the foreseeable future, at least until midwinter breaks were completed, uh, those will be here uh, starting next week. Uh, and at that time, after those breaks are completed, the state will take a look at existing COVID data and make a decision as to whether or not masks would continue to be required in schools. And again, there, there's separate state guidance to the Department of Health dealing with certain uh, so-called higher risk sectors, 
hospitals, nursing homes, uh, shelters, uh, and other uh, entities that are covered by a separate Department of Health requirement with respect to masking, and, and that would remain in place as well. So uh, again, this is another area where I expect we'll see further developments on a, a week to week basis. Uh, we will certainly touch base on masking on future webinars. Uh, and again, for the most recent information, you can subscribe to our blog or link to us on LinkedIn. We push out that content through our social media feeds as well. All right, now I can talk to John Godso about uh, the issues that he's gonna present on today. Uh, and he's got some good information for those of you who have responsibility and oversight over your employee benefit plans. Uh, John's gonna talk to you today about some significant developments in areas and, and points to consider. So John, great to have you with us. Great, Andy. Thanks so much. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Andy mentioned, I'm a member of our employee benefits practice group. And today we're going to talk about some of the impact, the continued impact that the uh, COVID-19 outbreak and pandemic has on employee benefit plans. I'm going to first step back to, to 2020 just to talk about the, the evolution of this. And, and for those who, who administer benefit plans are, are probably well aware of the history, and it's hard to believe that we're going on about two years of this. But if you recall back in 2020, early days of the pandemic, um, there was a national emergency declaration by the president. Um, and that really forced a whole bunch of different changes, both with the benefits world and in other areas, but focusing on the benefits world, most of the impact there was related to really suspension of various time periods in which both plan administrators and participants had to take certain actions under ERISA with respect to their employee benefit plans. And when we first started uh, getting guidance from the departments on this was in May of 2020. And this started really the initial flurry of guidance from both the IRS, DOL, as well as HHS, Treasury Department about, hey, how are we gonna handle this pandemic? What are we gonna allow uh, as far as easing of the usually real restrictive time periods that apply under ERISA and Internal Revenue Code for taking certain actions? And how are we gonna manage this going forward? So our, our first guidance that we got back in 2020, May 4th, was something that's really colloquially referred to as the joint notice. And that was because it was issued jointly by a number of different departments, including the DOL and IRS. And the basic message there was it required plans to disregard the period from March 1, 2020 until 60 days following the end of the national emergency, which again was declared by that time at, uh, by President Trump, of, uh, for six days following the end of that national emergency, and that was referred to as the outbreak period. Uh, so that period gets disregarded when determining certain periods and dates. And what those dates were, as specified in the notice, were special enrollment timeframes. If you're familiar with those, basically, if you have a special enrollment right, for example, if you have a birth of a child, typically the requirement is you have to notify the plan sponsor within 30 days of that happening in order to enroll that individual. Uh, so that time frame was suspended or told during this outbreak period that was defined by the guidance. COBRA timeframes, and this is really one where we were getting more guidance on and really impact a lot of folks. The time period both in which to elect and pay COBRA pre premiums was told or suspended or disregarded during this outbreak period, as well as claims procedure timeframes. If you're familiar with your benefit plans, there are certain required timeframes under ERISA in which to make a claim under the plan and a, an appeal under the plan. Those periods are disregarded during the outbreak period, as well as the external review process timeframes. And those external review processes deals with uh, health claims under the Affordable Air Care Act developed a, a scheme that allowed for external review. Again, those time periods were told or disregarded during this outbreak period. So this allowed some flexibility, like happened in, in many areas of the law with respect to the administration of benefit plans and when uh, participants can make elections and, and the deadline. And this was all really keyed off of the end of the national emergency. And then 60 days after that time, those time periods would begin running again. So for example, if you're just looking at COBRA, the general period is 60 days to make a COBRA election. That period was told during this outbreak period. So that's the initial guidance we got way back in the beginning of, of 2020. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, in 2021, we got some clarification from the departments as we rolled on to about one year of, of, pan, of the pandemic. 
And it wasn't really talked about initially a lot when that 2020 guidance came out. But the statutory authority for delaying these timeframes, for tolling these timeframes, was limited to one year. So as we got closer to that March 1 period, one year out of 2021, there was some confusion in the benefits committee, okay, or community, okay, what happens now? Uh, maybe many thought in May of 2020 that the national emergency period end, would end much, much earlier, but unfortunately it kept on going. So that required a new rule to be developed by the departments. And basically the new rule developed kind of these rolling one year periods, which are really based, not just based on the outbreak period, but the uh, limiting the total period uh, of a disregarded or tolling period to one year. So in that notice, 2021-01, the departments announced, here's your disregarded period. They end earlier of one year from the date you're first eligible for the relief. So, so in other words, the date you're first eligible uh, required to make a COBRA election, really that tolls for one year from that date, or 60 days after the announced end of the national emergency the end of the outbreak period. So that, that changed the rule basically. So it wasn't just based on this outbreak period and the 60 days after the end of the national emergency because that was still ongoing. It really made a cutoff date of one year uh, if that happened prior to the end of the national emergency, which is still ongoing. So we had to pivot a little in understanding when these dates might end from, for example, a COBRA purpose or a special enrollment purpose to, to really figure on a case by case basis when these periods would end for individuals. So we can go to the next slide, please. So we got additional 2021 guidance. So one issue, and this was really related to COBRA and ARPA. If you remember, there was the subsidy under ARPA that applied and ended for COBRA, uh, individuals who elect COBRA as a result of involuntary termination employment for certain periods. There was the ARPA subsidy that ended at the end of September. There really needed to be some clarification regarding how these extended periods would apply with respect to COBA, COBRA and ARPA. So in particular, excuse me, with respect to the issue of, if you know the COBRA rules, basically you have 60 days to make that election. And then once that election is made, another 45 days to make the payment. So if applied these one year periods, for example, to both those different elections, that could result in basically a two year period before uh, an individual had to make payment. Basically one year, they could wait one year in order to elect COBRA and basically another year because their time period would start running for the paint COBRA payment after that election was made, really could result in more or less a, a two year period. The departments clarified the issue and said, now basically those periods run concurrently. So you can't have one year both for the election and one year to make the payment. It's more or less gonna be a one year period both to make the election and the payment. So that was helpful news to plan sponsors. They also provided some technical clarification regarding the rules applicable to ARPA. I mean, one thing I think that plan sponsors should understand this extended period in order to elect COBRA uh, would not apply to obtaining the subsidy retroactively. That period ended in order to obtain the subsidy. Those elections had to occur basically over the summer. Uh, so there is not this open period to retroactively elect COBRA and get the subsidy but there's certain other technical aspects of the interaction between COBRA and ARPA that was discussed in this 2021 guidance. So we go to the next slide, please. So what do we do now? Um, I, the reason I thought this would be helpful for, for plant sponsors is I do get questions from time to time. Hey, what, what can we do when an individual hasn't paid their, their COBRA premium? Can we stop their coverage, uh, et cetera? Um, we have to take a hard look at those situations because of these ongoing tolling periods related to the national emergency. Um, so some common issues we see are COBRA elections and premium payments. For example, okay, someone hasn't elected COBRA yet. Do they still have the right to at a later period? It's going to depend on when that right first arose and whether we're beyond that one year period at that time when someone may try to elect COBRA. Same thing with COBRA premium payments. We're really at that one, since the national emergency is still ongoing, we're still looking at that one year period as far as what the tolling period is. Special enrollment periods, again, you, you know, typically you have 30 days to make a, to exercise a special enrollment, right? We got to consider that as well as claim deadlines. So what I tell most plan sponsors is, okay, we got to be cognizant of these rules and we got to coordinate them with the insurers and third-party administrators to make sure everyone's on the same page as far as getting someone enrolled who might make a late election, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that we're coordinated from the administration side. 
And then we have to look out for future guidance from the departments on this issue. The President Biden made the declaration in 2021 at the end of February. It more or less has a, a one year period associated with that. Uh, my understanding is it's likely he will continue the national emergency declaration, but that will come in the upcoming weeks, I believe. So we got to understand that this rule may change, although it's unlikely, and that the national emergency still may be ongoing past this one year period based on his, his most recent declaration. And if that happens, then we got to look and see if there's any future guidance from the departments about continuing this period and how plan sponsors should react to it. So overall, I think the takeaway is continue to be cognizant that we're still in national emergency period. That may change. And it does have impact on things like COBRA elections, COBRA premium payments, special enrollment rights that we need to think about before making a knee-jerk reaction based on what we historically know about how these rules are applied and the ability, for example, to terminate COBRA for uh, non-payment of premiums. Uh, so look out for future guidance, and we're happy to answer questions as, as that future guidance comes, because it is, it is one of these issues that, that people tend to forget about since it's ongoing for two years and it's continued guidance. Some of the other guidance we had was short-lived, but this one is still, we're still in a period where this guidance is applicable. Great, John, thanks so much. Very helpful information. And I think it, it illustrates, you know, one point that folks need to keep in mind and that's as we hopefully pivot from you know, this period where we've been dealing with uh, a number of changes related to, to COVID and hopefully emerging from the pandemic here in the relative short term that there will be, you know, changes and bumps uh, that are associated with that. Uh, for those uh, concerned with compliance in these areas. And let me just add too that uh, John and uh, our colleagues in our employee benefits practice group do a tremendous job of keeping folks up to speed on this through webinar programs that they put on themselves. If you have not attended one of them, I would highly recommend it. Again, lots of very useful information about issues that can, can be complex, uh, certainly at times. So John, thanks for being with us. And uh, Whenever there's an update, let us know and uh, we'll welcome you back. Thanks, Andy. We'll do. All right. Okay. Uh, next up is Travis Tallarico. Travis uh, is an associate in our labor department, also works in the litigation area, somebody that I have the pleasure of working with on a regular basis uh, and also a regular contributor here to our webinar. So a familiar face for all of you. Uh, as you may have seen in the news uh, recently, there is a significant piece of legislation that passed both the uh, House of Representatives and the United States Senate. To my knowledge, uh, it's still pending uh, review and uh, likely signature at the White House, but uh, it's, it's a piece of legislation that uh, deals with the issue of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and, and again, is another one of these uh, legislative initiatives that flows out of the Me Too movement. Uh, but this is certainly notable uh, on a number of fronts and Travis, uh, here is uh, going to present on this, give you some background. And, and I should add too that Travis put together a very helpful article on our blog, the New York Labor and Employment Law Report, going into depth on this issue for your background. I, I commend that article to your reading for reference. But without further ado, Travis, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Andy. Happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Again, Travis Tellerico uh, out of our Rochester office. Um, and as uh, Andy mentioned, I'm going to be uh, relatively briefly discussing this recent bill that uh, made its way through Senate last Thursday. Um, although this is going to be brief, it is very significant because it's going to have uh, pretty significant implications, uh, particularly for employers that have these types of agreements. So Andy already gave a little bit of background, but I think for anyone on the call who may have been uh, following the Me Too movement over the last few years, uh, this bill is the uh, significant product of that, and um, while it's formally titled the Ending uh, Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act of 2021, it has also been um, uh, more commonly referred to as the hashtag MeToo bill. Now, the uh, primary implication of what this is going to do is amend the Federal Arbitration Act to now prohibit and invalidate any uh, existing uh, con contractual agreements, which mandate, um, mandate empl employees who have workplace-related sexual assault or sexual harassment claims to uh, exclusively only arbitrate those claims. 
So now employees who have these types of claims are going to be able to bring these, uh, bring these claims in court. Um, a few things to note about this is it looks like that it's going to be applying prospectively. Um, and as Andy mentioned, I just checked this morning, President Biden still hasn't signed the bill into law yet. Uh, I don't see anything that would uh, indicate that he would not be doing so. But once he, he does sign the bill and it does come into, uh, it does go into full effect, it looks like that it's going to be applying for uh, any new claims. So claims uh, is going to be pers uh, applied prospectively, not retroactively. Um, another important thing to note is that, that it does not prohibit arbitration of these types of claims. It prohibits mandatory, uh, mandatory arbitration. So this is something, these, these types of agreements are found pretty commonly in a lot of employment contracts and employment agreements. And as condition of employment require employees to uh, submit any of these types of claims to the arbitration process, which also has uh, some greater implications other than the, the claims itself is since arbitration is usually much more of a closed door proceeding, there's a significant confidentiality aspect that goes along with, with arbitration. So moving forward, this is not going to be the case. Employees that have these types of claims may proceed with arbitration. Uh, it's, it becomes their election now, but they cannot, be, uh, they cannot be required to contractually in relation to their employment. Um, so again, pretty, pretty short and sweet here. If there are any, uh, any updates to the, the way the bill is currently written uh, before it's signed off on by President Biden, we'll certainly provide an update on that. But um, otherwise, that's, uh, that's about it on my end here. Great. Travis, thanks a lot. So one takeaway that I'm getting is if you, you uh, just to reiterate, if you have uh, an employment agreement or you use an, an arbitration agreement with respect to your, your workforce, whether a portion of it or, or all of it, uh, now would, would probably be a good time to take a look at that document in anticipation of this legislation becoming law and, and then you, know, you potentially having to make revisions to that. Uh, and, and I would add, it's not the first time um, that uh, employers in New York have had to, had to do that. Um, you know, we have a comparable statute in New York dealing with this as well. Uh, and, uh, but again, there's some different dynamics here. So just because you may have had your particular agreement reviewed and uh, approved with respect to New York's prohibition on uh, mandatory arbitration of certain claims, uh, you wanna make sure that it also comports with federal law here too. Uh, and for those of you who this term may be uh, new, right? Uh, you may not be familiar with these arbitration clauses or provisions or policies. Uh, these can be a very useful uh, uh, process and mechanism uh, value not only from the employer's perspective, but frankly, from the employee's perspective that provides a, a, a rapid, more cost-effective, more efficient means to resolve disputes, uh, particularly after uh, employment may end. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of uh, benefits to these arrangements too. And if you're interested in pursuing that, I encourage you to reach out to Travis or contact another bond attorney who can assist you with that. Travis, thanks again. Uh, I, maybe we'll have you back after this gets signed and if there's any uh, forthcoming guidance on it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Great. All right. Uh, last up, uh, we have my friend and colleague in our downstate office, Jessica Mahler. Uh, Jessica and I uh, talk all the time and compare notes on a wide variety of, of issues uh, of late, a lot of COVID stuff. And uh, we were doing so uh, on Monday with respect to a topic that I know remains on uh, the top of all of your minds, that being New York's paid COVID sick leave uh, benefit. And uh, so Jessica, what exactly is going on with this benefit right now? Summarize, you got 10 seconds, go. My, my one word summary is everything has been thrown up in the air and come back down to kind of land us really where we were before. Um, okay. I guess that was more than one word, but no, that's I, good, I, though. It's 10 seconds. Seconds. <laughs> I said 10 seconds. Yeah, you're fine. Um, so, so what, what has happened here? So just super quick refresher, just to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the New York state paid sick leave law. Um, this is the law that was implemented or, or took effect uh, way back when at the beginning of this whole thing uh, in March of 2020, 
We've seen various, you know, guidance documents and whatnot come out along the way. Um, but this is the, the law that in its simplest form uh, provides for paid sick leave, not chargeable to someone's accruals when an individual is under an official uh, order of quarantine or an official order of isolation with regard to COVID-19. Um, so what, what has happened over the past uh, couple of weeks that sort of, like I said, pulled the rug out from under us and then sort of got us back situated again? Um, so as everybody um, may recall from last week, um, there had been in place a guidance document that was issued by the Department of Labor. It was issued in, by the Department of Labor in January of 2021. Um, to try and explain and essentially put some limits on when this paid COVID leave would be available to individuals. Um, in the guidance document and in the related FAQs that were issued by the state, uh, the, some of the old FAQs um, I have up there on the screen right now, essentially what that guidance document and the FAQs said was people have three bites at the apple for this kind of leave. Um, essentially three, there's potential for three quarantine orders or isolation orders that can get you paid COVID leave uh, if you are subject to those, those orders. The first order was, it could be because you tested positive and had to isolate or, as a result of that. It could also be an order uh, that was issued because you were exposed to somebody with COVID and therefore you had to quarantine uh, per the Department of Health. So, so for that first order, you got your paid leave. The second and third orders, however, um, you could take advantage of this paid leave if you tested positive for COVID and the reason you were under the order was because you had tested positive for COVID. After potentially using this leave three times, there was no more uh, paid sick leave available uh, for you, even if you were under an official order of quarantine or, or isolation. So, so that was how the, the guidance and the state of everything was from January of, I think it was January 20th uh, to be exact, 2021, straight through for a little more than a year. Um, everybody sort of got familiar with this and, uh, you know, most people, uh, although you weren't required to put these limits in place, I would say most businesses, most employers did. So then what happened? Of course, we all remember over the past, you know, month, two months or so, we had a huge spike with the Omicron variant and everybody was, you know, out. There was huge uh, segments of our workforce that were out and uh, people take trying to take advantage of this leave. <clears throat> and what did the Department of Labor do? What did the state do? Is they rescinded this guidance that had been in place for just over a year. Um, by rescinding that guidance, where it left us was all of these FAQs that are on the screen, all of the information uh, that you see there was no longer in play. So then all we had at that point in time, and I'm talking about as of February 1st of this year, all we had was what was technically stated and the actual uh, text from the, the New York paid COVID leave statute itself. Well, when you looked at that statute, all it says, and I'm paraphrasing here, but all it says is an individual who is under the official order of quarantine or isolation is entitled to paid COVID leave. That statute does not itself place any limit on the number of times somebody can utilize this. It doesn't say three times in total. It doesn't say time two or three has to be because you've tested positive. So what ended up happening was the, the Department of Labor's uh, guidance that allowed for those limits got pulled, it was rescinded. And so 
now everybody was left to scurry with essentially uh, what what really was was playing out to be an unlimited amount of times that somebody could be entitled to, per the statute, uh, receive this paid New York COVID leave. Nobody was happy with that. Um, you know, no no business, no employer uh, was happy with that. And from what we have gathered, um, there was a lot of pushback uh, to the state when it rescinded that guidance, that, that three times uh, and you're out guidance. So fast forward to today and where, where are we now? Um, Kathy, can you go to the next slide, please? So today, and I believe this went up uh, at the end of last week, we now see essentially the same substantive um, information put up in new FAQs that are, that are issued by the state, available um, on the Department of Labor's website. And under these new FAQs, they essentially provide for and say everything that previously was said in the guidance and in the old FAQs that we had. Now, of course, the old FAQs, there was four uh, questions. Now we're essentially looking at two questions, but substantively, these FAQs are answering and saying, yes, there is a limit on the number of times an employee can be eligible for paid sick leave, uh, paid COVID leave. And that limit is exactly the same as we had seen previously, which was the first you get for any, any uh, exposure or positive official quarantine order, uh, but the second or third orders must be based on you yourself having tested positive. Um, and the language is virtually identical in these FAQ answers to the language that we saw in the Department of Labor's January 2021 guidance. Now, the Department of Labor has not formally reissued the guidance, the, the January 2021 20, guidance. Um, there has not been any kind of official pronouncement or public announcement that, quite frankly, that any of this has happened. Um, but it is telling that the state has now backtracked uh, a bit from, from the position that it was taking as of February 1st um, by, by now reissuing essentially the, the same guidance in the form of these new FAQs, giving us the ability to um, uh, institute the same limits that essentially were in place before. Um, now, I will just point out uh, one additional uh, item. Um, you know, I know I've, I've, I've got a lot of questions about it and I've uh, heard a lot of, uh, you know, uh, chatter uh, out there about um, somebody testing positive on a home test uh, versus a test that was conducted by a medical professional or by an actual healthcare facility. Um, and how that plays in and, and may change or impact the eligibility of somebody uh, for paid COVID sick leave under both the old guidance that, that the Department of Labor had issued and uh, under these current FAQs that are up there. And I will just point out that in the new FAQs, just like it was in the old FAQs and just like it was in the original DOL January 2021 guidance, if somebody is going to be taking advantage of a, a second or third period of paid COVID leave because they're, they've been officially ordered to quarantine, it has to be based on a positive COVID test. But it has to be based on a positive COVID test. And then the employee has to submit actual documentation 
from a medical provider or an actual testing facility that they have tested positive. So, so it doesn't say it explicitly that home tests are not available um, or can't be used for qualifying for um, the order and then and then this paid COVID leave. Um, but it effectively gets to that point because in order to qualify for, for the second or third usage by testing positive, you have to not only be under the official order of quarantine, you have to have tested positive and submit documentation of that positive test from a licensed medical provider or an actual healthcare testing facility. Um, so essentially it knocks, uh, it knocks home tests out of the mix in terms of um, eligibility and qualifying for, for this leave. So, you know, like I said in the beginning, um, there's been a lot of turmoil over the past few weeks. Uh, we had the rug pulled out from under us, lots of questions, uh, a little bit of uh, uncertainty, but things seem to have settled back to essentially the same place that we were um, before January, uh, before February 1st. So that's where we are. Andy? Thanks, Jess, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I echo a number of your concerns or, or points. I, I, you know, what I was hearing from our clients uh, and those who we work with otherwise was just, you know, con confusion and a bit of frustration and, and frustration from the standpoint of, you know, that, that they're very compliance minded and oriented, want to understand what, what they need to do in this situation, of course, provide the leave that needs to be provided, take care of employees, protect the workforce. Uh, but but it was challenging to you know figure out exactly what to do in, in the midst of you know the spike uh, the rescinding and you know and by that what we mean is they they pulled the guidance physically from the website where it had been published uh, and then having the the conflict with uh, you know trying to put the pieces back together so I, I agree I think we're back to basically where we were uh, uh, from the get go on this uh, and you know it's just really helpful to have that insight and, and guidance there. One of the questions that uh, we've gotten, I think, in, in the, in the Q&A feature is, you know, well, okay, do we still need to uh, rely on the attestation forms that uh, the state has provided? Uh, and again, my understanding is localities generally are, are not uh, issuing the, the prior isolation or quarantine orders, and instead the, the state has endorsed this kind of self-attestation process. And when I've talked to clients, about these forms, they found them to be very confusing. And I tend to agree with them. They, they, it's, they, I think they try to use a one size fits all approach here that really doesn't work because, you know, depending on the size of your business, your income, uh, and, and the number of employees that you have, all of that can dictate what type of benefit. And, and I think the forms are confusing, but um, it, it just tell me if you think otherwise, but Looking at the forms, I think they still can serve a purpose uh, to, to the extent, you know, there may not be an overlap with potential eligibility for paid leave uh, under, the, under the law. But again, I, I don't think the, if you read the guidance, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, if you read the guidance that you have on the screen, it, it, it seems to indicate that, yeah, you can accept those forms, but you could also still uh, insist upon having a, a test conducted by a third party as provided under the guidance. Right, right, Andy. So there's essentially two questions that, that you need to ask if you're evaluating if somebody would be eligible for this paid leave, right? The first question would be, is this individual under an official order of quarantine or isolation? If somebody has submitted an attestation to that effect, then you know, that first box gets checked. The second question though is, are they now eligible under the order? Are they now eligible to receive the paid COVID sick leave uh, for the time that they have to isolate or quarantine per the order? And then that's where you get into uh, the review and the analysis under these uh, FAQs and, and the guidance uh, that we have at this point. Just thanks. And, and just to reiterate for everyone here, uh, again, I encourage you when these issues come up, 
there, there is complexity. There's understandably confusion. Again, this is just one of the many different types of paid leave benefits that New York employers either voluntarily offer or required to now offer in the state. Again, where PSL is out there, PFL is also out there. So uh, work with your attorney. Uh, you can contact uh, your bond attorney uh, or anyone else on the panel here if you have questions. Um, please feel free to submit them. Jessica, thanks for joining us. And just one last note, um, we got a lot of questions about the HERO Act. Uh, you'll see in the chat, I, I posted that the emergency designation was extended today until March 17th. Uh, we got a number of questions about specific compliance issues uh, with respect to your infectious disease control plans. What do we still have to do? What do we not have to do? How does the masking changes work into that? Those are questions that are very specific and that are best addressed uh, by legal counsel and with the attorney-client relationship established. Again, we stand ready to work with you. If you have those questions, feel free to reach out to your favorite bond attorney and you can of course contact anyone here on the panel today. All right, so with that, I say thanks to our panelists. I wish you all well, be safe and take care of each other.